Hello and welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Wednesday, March 13th, 2019. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. This week, we are going to be talking a lot, and I mean a lot, about the NASA budget. So buckle up. It's going to be a, a lot. And the Brexit. Why not? Uh, and then we're going to talk about the NASA budget again. Uh, and then finally, uh, some interesting dust rings discovered in the inner solar system. And we might show you Opportunity's final photograph. Joining me this week on my screen right now is Dr. Morgan Rayburn. Morgan. Welcome back. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, for being manning the ship while I was gone. Uh, I, I appreciate it. Paul and I were like, we didn't even have to think about it. It was great. And I'm sure it just went super smooth. No problem. Good. Couldn't be better. Could, 100%. Could, you're totally right. Couldn't have gone easier. And that's Dr. Kimberly Cartier. Hey, Fraser. Happy podcast day. Yay. You missed a podcast day. <laughs> I, I bet it was not as happy as it, ours. It's possible it was happy. Uh, we you were, were in Costa Rica. We were in so Costa Rica. I mean, there's, there's a small that possibility. Wednesday, I think we were in the middle of the Costa Rican cloud forest looking at the resplendent Quetzal and the That doesn't bird. sound great at all. <laughs> yeah. Two extremely... <laughs> Uh, almost, uh, in, oh, sorry, endangered birds. In that in sounds Rica. horrible. Yeah, it was. Gosh. It was. It was rough. So I'm not jealous. Uh, yeah. Um, all right, and we've got our special guest, Luisa Ribal. Hmm? Did I get it? <laughs> yep, close enough. <laughs> yep, yep. Ribal, Ribal. Yeah. Uh, Luisa, thank you for joining us here on the Weekly Space Hangout. Um, who My are pleasure. you? And what do you do? I am an astronomer. I work at the California Institute of Technology, the place called IPAC, which is a data center and a sports center for many different infrared uh, missions. And this is where we host NASA's infrared data. I I think that one of my favorite spacecraft is Spitzer. And I know I'm that's... a big fan of Spitzer. <laughs> big, big fan of Spitzer. Um, I love these telescopes that allow us to see like the the night sky in a wavelength that we can't see with our own eyeballs and it brings up these different views and lets us look into all of these these areas that we just can't see um yeah, it is amazing i mean i mean we're as astronomers we study places we can never ever go things we can't pick up and turn around or put in a jar and watch go from start to finish so you we really have to take advantage of all the different kinds of light that make it to us. Yeah, and so can you talk a bit about like infrared and sort of what that allows us to see? Well, the main thing is that infrared allows us to see through the dust. So if like me, you study baby stars, baby stars are um, start life sort of embedded in a cloud of gas and dust that you can't see through in the optical. And the infrared allows us to peek through that dust and see the baby stars that live within. So that's the main reason I study it. I mean, you alluded at the beginning to some dust that may be affecting gravitational wave measurements. Yeah. Um, dust is a big deal in the infrared um, because you can see through it, but then you can also, it also affects the fluxes that you measure in the long wavelengths. And so, because there's dust all over the place, there's dust following Earth in its orbit that Spitzer actually flew through on its way away from Earth. Um, and there's all sorts of dust in our solar system as well as in our galaxy and in other galaxies. So dust is a big deal and Spitzer lets us uh, deal with the dust and like james webb is the next is is really the replacement to spitzer like the follow-on mission to spitzer in that it's an well, another infrared I kind of think of it as a follow-on mission to hubble right because it's really you know it's spitzer had much longer wavelengths than webb is going to have so you know webb is sort of a descendant of both spitzer and hubble in that sense and so specifically you study baby stars i do i study star formation and uh, so, I mean, where are we at with kind of the cutting edge thinking about about star formation? What are what are you sort of investigating right now? So, among other things, uh, Spitzer allowed us to really understand how stars form. Because when I say baby stars, I mean only a million years old, yeah. right? And the only way that you can study how stars form and evolve is by studying as many as you can over in as many different regions as you can to try to piece together how the process works. And Spitzer has allowed us to flesh out that model tremendously. Um, but one thing that's missing is exactly what happens right close to the star. And so the, the latest, um, what, 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 what am I to call it? The latest um, 
frontier, I guess, is investigating how things change with time. So we've known that young stars change with time for a long time. That was originally one of the defining characteristics of young stars is that they are not, that they vary in the optical. But it turns out they vary on all time scales over all wavelengths and they do really amazing things. And those variations, seeing how they change with time, gives us insight into what's happening right close to the star, how the matter is falling onto the star, what's happening in the inner disk of matter that's around the star, and whether or not planets are forming. All of this is bound up in, in, in how we're trying to attack it is dealing with the time variability of these, these stars. And like one of the questions that I get a lot is people are very fascinated that stage where you you know you have the the giant cloud of gas and dust that you know and then you always make the figure skater reference as they mm -hmm. pull in their arms and everything spins faster but but sort of those early times as the star is starting to f to form people want to know like like how long does it take till it actually turns on and and becomes a star you know how how long do these kinds of processes happen let's see 10 20 30 million years at least um because the the disk of matter around it is going to disperse in about 20 30 million years depending on i can't tell you exactly when the um when because when you have a genuine adult hydrogen burning mortgage paying adult star right um that's when you're actually burning hydrogen and that happens really quick if you have a lot of mass and it happens at sort of slower rates, the lower mass you go. And most of the stars in the universe are lower mass. So for some of the lowest mass stars, the ones that will eventually burn hydrogen, you know, it could be more than 100 million years before they actually start turning hydrogen into helium. And then some of those bigger stars, they just explode. They happen, yeah, that, that, that process happens really fast. Yeah. Because you live fast and die young if you're a massive star. And then the other thing that I think Spitzer has been really helpful for is being able to image the planets that are orbiting some of these newly forming Turns stars. Turns out not. So they're, what Spitzer's doing is looking for transits. So you have the, the, the bright star and you have the planet going in front of the star. Or if it's a really massive planet, the planet going behind the star. And so that's what Spitzer's been, been confirming, right? So if you have an observation from the ground or from other methods that says there's a planet there, if you can observe with Spitzer and watch not only the planet going in front, but the planet coming behind, because you're observing in the infrared, when the planet goes behind the star, you get a tiny little dip in the light as the planet goes behind the star. So some of those infrared photons that we're measuring are from the planet itself as it goes behind. You know, right before it goes behind the star and then it the star eclipses that light and then it reemerges on the other side right but spitzer had been one of the few tools that allowed us to to essentially detect and probe the atmospheres of right. some of those but that's planets. different than imaging that's different than imaging it's a yeah 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 <clears throat> um so now your work also is with the kepler uh, yes. observatory as well so can you talk about about the work that you've done with that yeah, so Kepler, everyone knows, is a you know like a planet hunting mission, and its main mission was to stare at a chunk of sky in Cygnus looking for planets. And those stars, they deliberately picked to be old and mellow stars because then the amount of light flickering you're getting from the star um, doesn't interfere as much with your ability to see tiny little dips from Earth-like planets moving in front of the star. Um, but uh, Kepler's gyros broke; they were down to two. Clever engineering happened, and they repurposed the mission into something called K2, which is what when things got really interesting for me, because planets are cool and all, but what I care about are the stars. And so when Kepler was repurposed to be K2, it was using, in essence, the, um, the solar wind pressure as its third gyro, which meant that it was basically doing this slowly. Um, but and but it could now look at things in the ecliptic plane, the plane of the solar system, or things really behind the ecliptic plane. So uh, now all of a sudden we could observe uh, stars of much younger ages and much lower masses than was ever planned to with the original Kepler. So the original Kepler was designed, of course, to have really exquisite uh, photometric precision, measure the brightnesses to very small, you know, very precise measurements. So, and for the K2 mission, even though the spacecraft is doing this, it still has that photometric accuracy. And so now I can study these very young stars, well, relatively young stars compared to what the original Kepler was observing, and lower masses in a, using a tool that we didn't think we were going to have available. So I have um, literally thousands of light curves, which is brightness as a function of time, 
for the stars. And so like for stars in the Pleiades, the stars in the Pleiades are relatively um, young. They're only 120 million years, only 120 million years. And they have gigantic spots. And so as the spots rotate into and out of you, you get brightness changes in what you're measuring from that star. And because you can look at how that brightness changes with time and because it repeats, you can get the rotation period of the star. And so I'm able to get then rotation periods for thousands of stars of known ages and masses because they're in these really famous clusters that have been studied for decades. Right, right. Um, and I, I mean, I love Pleiades as just this sort of hint at what our solar system and the other sibling stars might have looked like hundreds of millions of, of years ago to sort of get this right. sense of like what it might have looked like. And now these stars are, are lost in the orbits of the of the Milky Way at this point. Mm -hmm. I think we found one maybe. Uh, thanks to one. Gaia, one sibling star, maybe thanks uh, to yeah, Gaia. Yeah. yeah, thanks to Gaia and another and another survey. Um, but of course, Kepler, I mean, you know, that the loss of the gyros and now Kepler is out of fuel and we've mm -hmm. reported on this quite a bit. Um, but I mean, is there going to be a lot of data for you to keep on working? Well, so when Kepler went into this K2 mode, they could, um, you could observe things for about 70 days and then they would shift and look at something else for 70 days and keep going, right? So I have a whole new appreciation for what mail carriers endure because the data didn't stop. There was just 70, here's another pile, here's another pile, here's <laughs> yeah. another pile. And I'm like, I'm still working on campaign four and you're giving me campaign 12, oh my <laughs> God. So I, I have a lot of K2 data to pull through and that's gonna keep me busy for literally months because there's a lot of K2 data that I still need to pull through. Um, but of course, NASA launched TESS not too long ago and TESS is already more than halfway through its survey of the Southern hemisphere. So. Um, TESS is a very different mission in that it has, um, it's going to do the whole sky rather than just one field, or well, the whole sky except for the galactic plane. And it observes only at like 45 day, 35, 45 day stretches. Um, and so I, you know, the stars that I care about, nor, you know, rotate faster than 35 days. So that's probably okay for most of the stars that I care about. But for stars like our sun that go, you know, around in about a month, Right, you really would like to see two cycles before you believe it, yeah. right? And so that's that's hard for tests um, because it has just shorter it has shorter campaign lengths, and it also is mostly looking at the brighter stars. So certainly for the nearby stars and clusters, I'm going to definitely be getting into the test data eventually. But, but right now, I've got enough K2 data. Yeah, but as but as we mentioned, you know, uh, planets are boring. You're interested in the stars, so that's right. <laughs> um, but so so then, what is like a mystery of star formation that you are most interested in trying to get to the bottom of? Well, there's lots of different things I'm interested in. I'm interested in understanding what makes a star choose, well, choose. What, why, why do the disks disperse, right? Because when you have a star form, you know, a star that's forming, it, you know, forms a disk before it forms the star, right? And the disk is what you get planets out of. And that makes a lot of sense in the context of our solar system. And then we have to go and find planets that are mysteriously perpendicular to the rotation of the star, right? Yeah. It's like, why, yep. why, how, I don't understand. And then there are stars that seem to lose their disk really fast. And there are stars that seem to keep their disk for a really long time. Why? Is it a chemistry thing? Is it a magnetic field thing? Are they forming planets? If so, when? Does it need a short-lived disk or a long-lived disk to make that work? And when they form the planets, are the planets going to migrate in? Because if there's still a lot of disk matter left, that might affect the planet migration. So trying to untangle you know, the disk lifetime is one of the things that I'm interested in. And then with the K2 data, you know, in, in terms of angular momentum is one of those things in the universe that's conserved, like energy. Energy is conserved and angular momentum is conserved. And in our solar system, Jupiter has most of the angular momentum. So trying to understand how the, the, the spin rate, the rotation rate of the stars changes with time is going to fold into how you understand the angular momentum of the, of the planetary system yeah, you know how, how that happens, right? Because the star is undergoing tremendous structural changes too, right? Because when they're very young, they're completely convective, and by the time they're the sun's age, they have a radiative core, 
which may or may not be rotating more quickly than the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. there are some people who think that that shear in between the fast rotating core and the slower rotating envelope is what gives you magnetic fields in the first place. Right. So trying to understand how the magnetic field folds in and interactions with the disk and the rotation rate changing as a function of time and trying to understand where the angular momentum is going, all of that is stuff that I'm interested in. That's amazing. Um, well, and, and, and in fact, I guess, as all those disks turn into planets, it, you know, it comes back around to, to planets. But, but just like, you know, I think that we have always wondered, you know, is the solar system normal? And now as we discover more and more planetary systems out there, and, and also we're able to see all these different timelines mm -hmm. and we think about you know how say you know the planets migrated over time how uranus and neptune switched places uranus is locked knocked over on its side what happened to the asteroid belt because like, all of these these situations here in our solar system and i think we have this assumption that these you know we had this assumption that these th we're going to see these things again and again out there in the in the universe and, but now we see not only we're seeing other planetary systems but we're seeing these baby planetary systems and again yeah. i think some of my favorite pictures those from the NRAO, these beautiful planetary disks resolved yeah, in radio from waves Alma. from the Alma. Alma stuff yeah, is amazing. and you see, so you can see all of these different like spiral structures, and, and yeah, and so now you're starting to say, okay, so there's the the starting conditions are different. Clearly, the end conditions are different, and so it's got to be like now there's like a thousand different roads that this can all go down, yeah. as opposed to just like clearly like, here's what all happens every single time it's really confusing but in a really exciting way <laughs> yeah, it'll keep you busy well exactly. on on that note where can people go to find out more about what you're working on so there's lots of different places um my name is fairly unique so if you google me you'll find my stuff um i've been involved in a couple of different press releases there's um some of the images that attracted your producer were yep. uh, images that i took with spitzer of the north american nebula it's going to bring that up for people to take i love those because the the reason that it, the nebula is called the north american nebula is because in the optical it looks like north america yeah. Right. But when you look at what it looks like in the infrared, it looks totally different. <laughs> you can't even see the same shapes. Yeah. And um, the thing that's in the Gulf of Mexico, it becomes the infrared. The Spitzer images reveal hundreds, if not thousands of baby stars being born in the Gulf of Mexico in the in this North American nebula. So um, so that I, I love those images. Those are really cool. And NASA turned it into a big poster that you can, yeah. that you can get. I think I've seen that. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, but one of the other things that I do is um, something called NITARP, which is the NASA IPAC Teacher Archive Research Program. So mm -hmm. what I do is I work with small groups of teachers uh, for a year doing a real scientific research project, getting into the real data, doing real science. Um, teachers get three trips out of it. Um, and we're that website is nitarp.ipac.caltech.edu. Yep. And so that is, we're going to be um, soliciting applications for 2020, probably uh, in a couple of months. And the applications will be due in September. And the you know the the class of 2020 starts out in January 2020 and goes through January 2021. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. And uh, no problem. My pleasure. And good luck getting to the bottom of the uh, of the whole star formation process. It's a be... lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> Let us know if you figure it out. Okay, great. Thanks. All right. Thanks. All right. See you later. All right. Bye. All right. So uh, we're going to move on to the rest of the news. But before we do, I just want to give a big thank you, a shout out, as always, to our good friends at the Weekly Space Hangout crew. They are the producers. They are the co-creators. They are both the fans and the uh, brutal taskmasters that uh, keep the show going. And we couldn't do this without you. So if you want to be a part of this community, please go to WSHcrew.space. They will welcome you with uh, loving arms, and they will help put you to work so that you can be an executive producer of the show. You want a guest on the show? They will help you organize that guest as an executive producer. It's the quickest promotion you'll ever get. All right, WSHcrew.space. All right, Morgan, why don't you set us up, and then we will get into it. Uh, about the budget? Budget, yeah. Oh, I'm going to toss this one to Kimberly, what? who wrote an outstanding okay. article 
All right. Week yeah, about, Morgan, Morgan's about. got some specific details about our favorite not launched rocket. <laughs> uh, okay, fine, fine. Uh, we'll start with the overall so, budget, and then we'll dig into what Morgan was going yeah. into as well. So there's, so uh, on Monday, the U.S. administration released their budget request for fiscal year 2020. It's hard to believe that number is actually coming up, um, and part of that included <clears throat> what. Uh, what funding they want Congress to give to NASA and other science agencies. Uh, when you dig into the NASA budget, my personal opinion is that it's not great, but it's not also not terribly surprising. Uh, many of the numbers uh, in the budget request for 2020 uh, sort of mirror the same priorities that we saw last year yeah. when they released their <laughs> budget request for 2019. Uh, and as a reminder, when Congress actually gave a budget in 2019, it did not look anything like the president's request for this year. Right. So the president's. Uh, so keep request, that in mind as we're yeah. talking about all the terrible things that are in this NASA budget <laughs> is that Congress, the current Congress, very much did not listen to the last budget request. Well, it was uh, like but, we. I remember that, that whole process, right? Because we were. We, like we were sad yeah we were super sad and we were like oh over w yeah first yeah w and first and we're gonna do that again everything yeah. and, and in the end it turned out that nasa got more money than they had the previous years yeah. many of the missions that we thought would be canceled were not canceled and all of that uh the current budget request mirrors a lot of the same things that the administration demonstrated that they wanted nasa to do for example not working on w first until James Webb launches, not having a whole separate department for STEM engagement or education, uh, reducing the number of climate science missions that NASA is participating in, uh, reducing the science budget for all science divisions in NASA, the pure research budgets, uh, and also devoting about half of their total budget towards their Moon to Mars initiative, getting humans in a what they call a sustainable human presence on the moon uh including the lunar gateway and other associated missions and then trying to get humans to mars that particular initiative takes up more than 50 percent of nasa's budget in this request it's a lot yeah <laughs> um and be and even within certain uh mission directorates and divisions a lot of the sub allocations within those show that the priorities within those divisions are shifting from pure research or earth science or deep space or um, satellite telescopes uh, to this moon to Mars initiative. All right, so things, let's- so Things first, that support the human space flight program. Let's talk about what's getting cut. W first. W first, Again. just like gone. Yes, uh, and when pressed over and over again, they said, James Webb is the priority for that for this administration right now. We're gonna get James Webb up. We're putting all of our resources to keeping that 2021 launch date. And because of that, there's not enough money to also develop W first at the same time. They said it's a priority thing because there's only so many dollars for NASA. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a different issue. Uh, there are only so many dollars for NASA, and if we have to pick, we're gonna we're going to finish James Webb and get that okay. up before we start devoting resources to W first. STEM and education outreach gone. Gone and, again. And this was a thing that was also zeroed out in their last budget mm -hmm. request. Congress actually raised their budget for this year right. from what it was before. And so what uh, are some like that? I mean, that's like in many cases, a lot of the public facing from from NASA, a that, lot of the that ways is, that people And it's a lot of uh, also the outreach programs that work with schools that work with uh, some internships and fellowships, they, the NASA administrators say that those particular internships, fellowships, grants and such uh, will just be shifted to other divisions and other directorates, but the amount of money they quoted for that particular effort was still less than half of what, they're, what STEM education is already getting. And then Earth Science. Earth Science took a big hit in the pure science pure science research money, and also two of their climate science missions. Um, the president's last budget request actually canceled four. None of them were actually canceled. Uh, and this one only tries to cancel two. So. What the? So Kimberly's so, right 
about the fact that this budget in a practical sense is worth as much as one that I could scribble down yeah. on a piece of paper on my desk. But where it does matter is as an indication of sort of the thinking and interests and directions of, of NASA leadership. Uh, because the leaders of NASA, of NASA, like any federal agency, are appointed by the executive branch. And, and so what's contained in here in terms of things like, well, how do we separate between robotic exploration and human exploration? Uh, or how are we allocating uh, resources for education? Those kinds of things will matter along the margins once the actual budget is passed, because Congress's budget will say, thou shalt do this and this and this and that. And there will be a, a lot of those things that they're just gonna have to do, whether they want to or not, as we've seen with the last budget. But there's always this sort of large realm where the law isn't really specific or the implementation details need to be worked out. You know, these funding bills can't say how to build a thing. They say, build that thing. And then you, then the administrator of NASA and his deputies go forth and implement all of those, those things. And what we can learn from a document like this is kind of the way in which they're interested in going about implementing those things. Because this is like, you know, their pie in the sky dream vision. Yeah, and one of the things to keep in mind, like I mentioned that within certain directorates and divisions, uh, how the funding was allocated all supports their human space flight exploration program. And if you dig into the science mission directorate in particular, every single subdivision of that, Earth science, planetary science, heliophysics, astrophysics, they all get uh, are reduced in funding from what's currently done. But heliophysics in particular doesn't actually take that big of a hit. And that's because, you know, studying solar radiation and solar wind will impact astronauts right so so that is really the theme here right is yes is the america is going to land people on the moon and stay there and stay there and then go to mars yeah that's the whole theme Take of that, this budget 100 percent. that's where that's where it's going yeah. and not only do that but do it in the quickest and cheapest and most efficient way possible and that's really where you start to see things like relying more on commercial rockets as opposed to SLS. Right. And, and, and Morgan's going to launch into that in one yeah. in one second. Um, but but before he does, is there anything good here? I mean, it is... There, there is some good things. What do you... there, there are some redeeming factors, and those are for uh, the missions that are not cut, I will say. The missions that are not cut. Uh, for example, Mars 2020 is still there. The yet undecided Mars sample return mission that goes along with Mars 2020 is still there. Europa Clipper is still there. Uh, a bunch of the lunar missions that we were all very excited for are still there. Money for CubeSats are still there. Uh, what else? James Webb not only is fully funded, but actually got a funding boost in order to maintain the 2021 Just launch. What it needed. Just what it needed. More money. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Maybe it won't go over that money. Who knows? What, what, what are the chances? Uh, SLS and Orion are fully funded. Gateway is fully funded. Yeah. Uh, those are all good things. We like these missions. We're happy to still see them there. We wish there was a, a Europa lander a, associated with Europa Clipper. That's not there. So, but there um, was one a month ago. There, I mean, there still with is. the Congress budget. The, and now... the, enacted, the, the budget enacted by Congress has it. Yeah. It's and, still going to have it for all of 2019. It's, that budget's not going anywhere until there's a new one. Right. Uh, or this one runs out. One of the two. Uh, but, you know, all of these things, th those are positive. Uh, the fact that there are still Earth science satellites that are being developed, uh, the Orbital Carbon Observatory 3, uh, and there's another one whose name I'm forgetting. I apologize. Uh, those are still there, too. And those are missions that we wanted. Uh, Landsat, for yep. example. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, like I'm pretty excited about a Mars sample return mission. Like it feels yeah, like the culmination of this whole Mars exploration program to finally bring these careful. Like it's all about the study for for of ancient water on Mars, all the best places, the most interesting places. The Mars 2020 rover is going to be the right machine mm -hmm. to find these samples and poop them out on the surface, and then, you know, a future. Yeah, I mean, one, a big component home. of Mars 2020 is the collection of these samples and essentially like bagging them up 
and they're just going to sit there yeah. unless there is a sample return mission to bring them home. All right, Morgan. If you're specifically like narrowly interested in NASA, this really isn't a terrible budget. I mean, at the top line, NASA only took a 2% hit. Uh, you know, compare that to the National Science Foundation, which saw proposed cuts about 12%. And the NSF funds lots of astrophysics research, although not very much planetary science, uh, or the EPA, which uh, was pr projected to take a hit of 31%, uh, or the National Institutes of Health, including things like the National uh, Cancer Institute, which was cut by several billion dollars for, for cancer research. So really, of all the science uh, fields in, this, in the civilian end of the spectrum, NASA by far came out the best of, of those yeah. agencies. Yeah, I mean, if uh, but it's only a player in a much broader science um, endeavor that it would struggle tremendously under uh, the burden of of this budget that will never come to be. All right, so let's talk about SLS, Morgan. <clears throat> Yeah, and this is where you really, really sort of see this idea that it doesn't really matter what the president wants, it's what Congress wants, but it's revealing to see what, what NASA is talking about. Uh, because this budget and sort of some ancillary details around it really suggests that NASA leadership is losing patience and, and maybe even losing faith with the SLS program. Uh, and so there's sort of like four main things that the, we saw this week that kind of reinforced that. Uh, one is that there was actually a, a budget cut uh, to SLS um, of around, I think, 17%. And a lot of that is was planning for the future stage of SLS that would be used to launch humans to the moon. So they're going to build this sort of smaller version first and not even think about building the larger version until right. until later. Kind of going along with that are two pieces of what SLS was supposed to do, one of which was deliver the cargo to the moon in the form of like a lunar lander or a habitat, et cetera, for that. Uh, and NASA has said that they're considering the use of commercial rockets um, to deliver that cargo, much the same way that they're using commercial rockets to deliver cargo to the ISS. Uh, they also said that they're evaluating whether they can launch the next mission of Orion on a commercial rocket. That would probably be either the Delta IV Heavy, which launched the last uh, Orion test like maybe four, four or five years ago now, uh, or the Falcon Heavy. And kind of taken together, that's the two pieces that SLS was supposed to do, launch stuff to the moon and launch people to the moon. And NASA is now uh, sort of actively evaluating whether they can avoid SLS for, for either of those, uh, which would leave SLS's only role as launching sort of deep space planetary science missions. Um, but NASA also indicated in this budget that they would like it not to be required for SLS to be used to launch the Europa Clipper. Uh, and included sort of the eye-watering number that we kind of all knew, but it's sort of stark when you see it written out that if they didn't have to use the SLS and they could use instead, say, Falcon Heavy, they would complete the same mission uh, at a savings of $700 million, which is the equivalent of an entire Discovery class mission. Yeah. Uh, so basically, like you could launch a second Kepler and have Europa Clipper with the lander, or you can choose to use SLS to launch uh, just the Europa Clipper mission. So, and so you so put all this stuff together and it really seems like NASA doesn't want this. Yeah. But then there was a quote from uh, Richard Shelby, uh, chairman of the relevant committee in the Senate, who happens to be uh, from the great state of Alabama, uh, who s literally said, uh, we will fund SLS because it brings jobs for right. people in my, in my state. It doesn't matter what NASA wants. Right. And so, so that's the tension here. Yeah. So let's get into this, right? This idea that I mean, when the space shuttle was shut down in 2011 and, you know, it was a dangerous vehicle, a you know, it suffered two loss of two orbiters, 14 people died. It was a it didn't fulfill the mission that it was originally supposed to do. And I think it was the right decision. It was a beautiful spacecraft, but it, the right decision was to shift to to capsules to deliver people to the International Space Station and and 
rockets capable of carrying various cargo payloads into into space like i think that's the, that was the right decision but you had this enormous workforce that was specialized building space shuttles and so from the original constellation program through the obama period into you know into sls it was about repurposing all of those people who were working on the space shuttle to work on a spacecraft that was that was inherited a lot of its parts from the space shuttle, same expertise, same mold, same solid rocket boosters, same engines, and so on and so forth in a format that really had one job, which was to launch heavy payloads way off into space. But, and so, and I think if we hadn't seen the rise of SpaceX and Blue Origin and all of these alternatives, then I don't think there would really be a lot of a question. There would, there's no real, except for maybe a Delta Heavy, there's just no really heavy launch vehicles and nothing, even the Falcon Heavy won't come close to the capability of the, of, of the SLS. I mean, it is a monster, monster rocket. And if what you want to do is throw thousands of kilograms at Jupiter, that's the machine right now to do it. If you want to build a, a, a space station in orbit around the moon, that's the vehicle to do it. But the cost is, is in, insanely enormous. And you went into this, right? That you go and get a, um, uh, you know, you get the savings, $700 million in savings from the Europa Clipper. And that's just like, like, that's what they think it's going to be. But like, we've seen so budgets one go- time. Yeah, use it one time. We've seen budgets go up and up and up, right? Like maybe it's a seven hundred million dollar savings. Maybe it's a one billion dollar savings. Maybe it's a three point one billion dollar savings. Like like until that thing actually gets off the launch pad. So, don't you feel like this reckoning for SLS has been coming for a long time, and and now it's time to have to call the question and really get to the bottom of this about whether the SLS is the right machine, especially now that there seem to be fairly viable alternatives? Well, definitely SLS is not the right machine for virtually anything. Uh, it might be the biggest rocket, but how many times are we launching the, the biggest stuff? Uh, and this is really sort of the flip side of the subtext of our whole last bit about how the president and NASA wants all of these things to happen. But Congress is going to come and save us by saying, no, you must do this, you must do that, you must fund education, you must have these missions, et cetera, et cetera. In, in that sense, uh, having Congress there to require things to be done uh, is a good thing. Uh, but that sword cuts both ways. And here, NASA uh, leadership, as well as basically anybody with a pulse in the space industry has identified that SpaceX is, or SpaceX, that SLS is a hindrance to sort of successfully carrying out these goals. And yet, if Congress passes a budget that, you know, is a law that says you will use SLS to launch the Europa Clipper, then, you know, there goes that $700 million, even if there was an option that was just as good uh, out there. Yeah, it's the law. SLS, it's the law. For now. For, for now. So so what do you think, Kimberly? Like, keep SLS, keep moving forward, ditch it entirely? Like, we're in this mushy middle now. We, we are in this mushy middle. And, you know, with every mission, there does come a point, a turning point, where you've invested so much money into it that you sort of have to see it through. And we've talked about this in relation to James Webb, for example. Um, I don't think necessarily that we're there yet with SLS. I think we're rapidly approaching that point. And other things in this budget include dropping the second version of SLS and the second mobile launch pad. Um, they're pulling back massively while also saying finish it. Mm -hmm. So I think we're going to rapidly approach that point. Probably, maybe if not with this coming congressional budget in 2020, the one that actually becomes law, but certainly in the next, the one after that or the one after that. Yeah. Um, I mean, the first two of the lunar exploration missions uh, were set to launch years ago mm -hmm. and were delayed because of SLS. It was some, yeah, it was yeah, 20, 2017. Yeah, at I least the... a couple, maybe four or five years ago. I, yeah. I don't remember the exact number. And those have already been delayed. Now, 
there is a space policy director that says you're going to go to the moon you're going to do it yeah. by this date in a couple years uh and just a couple of days ago the administrator of nasa said if we have to use commercial rockets to do that we're gonna do that yes no matter where sls is so is this like like elon musk has played this perfectly at this point that the falcon heavy is i mean they, they haven't done their lunar uh mission yet but this is in the works to send uh some paying customers in a trip around the moon well that's what it's gonna take right is they're going to keep pork barreling the SLS until somebody else is like on the moon yeah. with a cheaper rocket. And that doesn't have to be actually walking around on the moon, but sending people in orbit about the moon or landing these heavy payloads. And once other people start doing it faster and cheaper, then when there's an actual threat of being left behind, it will change. Right now, when, you know, when it's no longer competitive. Yeah. 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 And, and so the, I mean, up until this point, right we always laugh about musk time that that these things always stretch off into infinity and that the amount of time it's going to take you know that that falcon heavy is whatever 10 years behind schedule uh here comes the starship which is in theory going to be a ludicrous vehicle and yet who knows how long the thing's going to actually take um and yet uh and so you and so this is like this fear uncertainty and doubt it's like fud right it's like it's like, do you keep working on this incredibly expensive, really just hole where, you know, money goes to die on the SLS, or do you pull back and then it turns out SpaceX is enabled to solve various engineering issues about, you know, water or droplets of fuel sweating out of a stainless steel spacecraft using dual purpose air breathing raptor angel like it's a it's a it's a like right now like the falcon heavy launched we saw it happen we're about we're about to see a new one we hope uh launch again we're gonna see this more and more in theory this spacecraft will eventually become human rated because they're gonna send people around the moon or not musk time um but as you you know as you said like and as the Musk years extend outward, if it, if it takes him 10 years to get the vehicle doing that job, do they have to keep developing SLS? Do they just shut it down and just wait? Right? What do they do? This is why I'm not in charge, because I can't make these decisions. All right. What would I do? I would cancel SLS, and I would probably just work on extending human launch capability on crew dragon boeing starliner and and then trying to make falcon heavy crew capable I think well that's what i mean doing. the other option here is to sort of the hybrid option which is to cancel sls and take even some small fraction of that money and give it to spacex yeah. or and blue, blue origin, origin. Or whatever like any other normal government procurement program works and the miracle of something like the falcon heavy is that they basically built it without a customer and yeah. yet still got it off the ground yeah. it they you know this is an administration that firmly believes that uh private industry is the most effective way to carry out national policy here is a golden opportunity yeah. to put that into action and we are at a time when the aerospace industry and the launch industry is white hot right now. We are seeing tons of new rocket companies happening both in the U.S. and in, you know, we think about New Zealand, right, Europe. There's all kinds of really interesting new rocket companies that are coming out at the same time. So if you did have to cut those 30,000 jobs, I forget how many people work on, on, on SLS. Like it's a lot there would be jobs, especially if you then push those contracts towards Blue Origin and said, make the new Armstrong happen. Uh, you would see both SpaceX and like new, a lot of new work, both SpaceX and Blue Origin would probably need to bring on a lot of engineers, a lot of people. They would probably absorb a lot of that workforce. You could probably minimize the damage uh, to getting voted back in the great state of Alabama. Uh, but maybe not. I don't know. It's tough. 
Man, I, I like like you, Kimberly. I don't want to. No. I don't want the job. I don't want to make that decision. No, no, exactly. Uh, all right. Well, let's. Uh, I'm sure next week things will have continued to unfold, and we will have to. Uh, we'll give yeah, you there'll an be update. there'll be many more details about the specifics in this budget released on Monday, uh, which may have some answers about SLS and Orion. Yeah, and then. When Congress does their budget, uh, it'll all this whole conversation will be irrelevant. Yeah. So there you go. Look forward to that. Uh, all right, let's move on. Uh, I think uh, Morgan, you had another story. Yeah. Miraculously, uh, U.S. politics isn't the largest dumpster fire in the world right now. Um, we got to cross the pond and and visit Britain, which is rapidly careening and only accelerated this week towards their exit from the European. Union, uh, our, our favorite Brexit. Uh, and one of the things we haven't had a chance to talk about yet is what this might mean for uh, the British uh, space industry. Uh, because like you said, the uh, world of exploration, and especially like around launch vehicles right now, is just white hot. And it seems like you can't go 50 miles without running into a new company that's trying to launch small rockets to deliver uh, you know, donuts worth of payload into uh, into space, and and Britain is no uh, stranger to having those sorts uh, of of companies. But they also have you know a robust national space program uh, as part of the European Space Agency. And in fact, uh, uh, the UK is one of the largest na national funders of of ESA. Uh, but with their uh, departure from the EU at the end of the month, they'll also in all likelihood be departing ESA as well. Uh, and that has implications for ESA, but also a lot of implications for, for uh, Britain. Uh, for example, um, Europe has spent the last decade building uh, a competitor or supplement to uh, GPS called Galileo. It's a worldwide satellite navigation system. Uh, and Britain will not be able to uh, use the military frequencies on Galileo to receive the most accurate positionings, just like they won't be able to use the military frequencies on GPS or the uh, military frequencies on the Russian or the Chinese uh, satellite networks. Uh, and so they're going to find themselves as one of sort of the world's premier militaries cut off from the tool that is basically fundamental to to war fighting today after having invested more than a billion and a half pounds into the development of the program uh in the last in the last decade uh and some of that money was able to come back to britain uh because um of the way contracts are issued to do the work just like uh nasa contracts basically go to all 50 states uh isa contracts are spread out through throughout all of the EU nations, um, but they are preferentially given to uh, member states. And so there's a lot of work that's being done in Britain right now that won't be able to, to continue. Uh, and then finally, they're gonna miss out on a lot of these active um, missions that are collecting really important data about, for example, space weather and how that in, in packs things like your satellite communications uh, or satellites that are designed to measure the effects of climate change or map uh, land use, kind of like the US Landsat program or even a um, mission that was actually based in Britain to detect uh, and track space debris uh, is going to have to move uh, back to mainland Europe uh, in order to persist within the EU. And so we're, we're entering this period of, of uncertainty. And if there's one thing you've ever learned from the Weekly Space Hangout when we get into these budget discussions, it's that you cannot conduct space exploration when you don't have continuity. Yes. Because you have to plan five or 10 or 15 years in advance just to get the simplest things done. Uh, and this is the disruption of all disruptions for continuity in, in Britain, but also for continuity with ESA. And the missions that they're planning and the way that the contractors that they rely on. And so we're next couple of years are going to be choppy waters to try to figure out what all the impacts of, of Brexit are assuming it actually happens at the end of the month. Yeah. So, question. Do we, do we know what may happen to uh, data access and flow of information for scientists in Britain? 
Well, it, it depends on the Brexit, right? Visa, yeah. Like if they if they hard Brexit, oh, then they are going to they are literally going to be the same as Canada. Right. They will have, an, have the same interaction with the rest of Europe that Canada does. The same trade, the same everything. Right. Freedom of movement, lack of freedom of movement, ability to bid on contracts, which is not right. So, I mean, we saw this shoe drop uh, several months ago when when these European companies started to say, sorry, Britain, we can't let you bid on these contracts. Uh, so. I mean, it's going to be no, so whatever, I mean, it's going to be on a case by case basis, but we saw what happened with, for example, uh, the Rosetta mission, right? That we weren't able to see the good pictures until the European scientists were, were done with it. Right. ESA has much more restrictive data sharing policies than, than NASA does, although much of their data ultimately enters the, the public record in the same way that U.S. scientists or Canadian scientists uh, can, can access that data whether there'll be any sort of legacy arrangements for team members that were on these teams from Britain, I think will almost wholly depend on the way in which that the exit occurs. And like Fraser said, if, if there's a hard Brexit, then, you know, they're going to wake up on, on April 1st and it's like that they were never part of Europe yeah. and, and all of the, the consequences that that entails. And so we, we just are in this moment of uncertainty yeah. where, you know, are they going to be able to do their work? We don't really know. Yeah, just wait and find out. Sorry if you need to plan, but you don't get to plan right now. Uh, okay, Kimberly, save us with one quick story that has nothing to do with politics. Nothing to do with politics. It has all to do with the inner part of the solar system and unexpected discoveries in the inner part of the solar system, which isn't something that we talk about all that often. We generally like to think we know what what exists between us and the sun uh turns out we don't so much know what exists between us and the sun because just this week there were two separate papers that discovered uh that there's likely unknown stuff there the first one talks about the discovery of a ring of dust that shares mercury's orbit around the sun uh now keep in mind earth has a, a co-orbiting ring of dust Venus has a co-orbiting ring of dust, but until now we thought that Mercury's orbit was pretty clear of any sort of dust, uh, given that it's so close to the sun and the solar wind and the magnetic field should have swept all of that away long before now. But uh, scientists who were looking to test some methods uh, to, uh, to be used for the Parker Solar Probe and, and clearing up some of those images actually discovered Lo and behold, Mercury does actually have a pretty large disk of dust uh, that shares its orbit. It's something like 15 million kilometers wide, and it's actually pretty inflated above and below uh, Mercury's orbit. And why is it there? Why is it there? That's an excellent question. We don't know why it's there. What is what the most likely theory is? that it's leftover dust that is being swept inwards from the outer parts of the solar system, like the asteroid belt that gets trapped there temporarily in Mercury's orbit, or it's leftover material from when comets are sweeping in towards the sun. Uh, given that there is a lot of solar wind and, mag and magnetic activity there, that's probably why the disk is so much more extended and inflated relative to the disks we see at Earth and Venus. Uh, but we still actually don't know why it's there and where it came from and if it's temporary or replenished we don't know all of that we just know that it's there we didn't know that before yeah the sun has rings the sun Take has that, many Saturn. rings yeah the second <laughs> thing we learned hmm? the second thing we learned this week is having to do with venus's uh dust ring that orbits uh along with venus and some uh some models of how that particular dust ring could have gotten there suggests that it's actually probably from uh, yet undiscovered asteroids that are also sharing Venus's orbit, sort of like the Trojan asteroids are sharing Jupiter's orbit. We've never discovered these particular asteroids before, but after testing many different scenarios of how this dust could have gotten into Venus's orbit and stayed there, uh, other other theories and other methods of doing this, like having dust sweeping in from the asteroid belt and somehow magically stopping in Venus's orbit and getting trapped there, those theories don't actually pan out and they don't match 
what we actually see around Venus. The only way to do that is if you actually have orbits, uh, asteroids that are still in that orbit and knocking into each other just enough to keep that disk around. All right. Now, you'll all notice that I didn't have a story this week, uh, but I wanted to share one picture here. Uh, oh, here we go. I'll show the co-hosts as well. So I hope you guys can mm. see. So what you're looking at here is the final photograph, the final panorama taken by Opportunity uh, just before the dust storm came in. And so I'm over, sad. Yeah, I know, I know. So I should have gone started over here, but you can see sort of, you know, cool images. You can see this, the, you know, the hill on in, uh, Endeavor Crater Rim, Perseverance Valley, a little bit of, little bits of opportunity. And then you've got over on the left hand side, incomplete image frames. Mm. Oh, it's so sad. So, I miss it. Yeah, I know. Thank you, Opportunity. Ah, uh, yeah. All right. I'm sad. <laughs> All right, we're back. Okay, so uh, quickly, uh, everybody, uh, what's something cool that you're working on? Kimberly. Oh, so one of the cool things I was working on today was a paper that shows that some waterfalls actually just form themselves without needing something like an earthquake or a landslide to form a waterfall. They just happen. Gravity. <laughs> so check that out on EOS. Right on. Morgan? Uh, I want to give my shout out to NASA. Yesterday was the 30th anniversary of the World Wide Web. And I bet many people don't know that NASA maintains E, which is one of the 13 fundamental DNS servers that keeps the internet alive. So without NASA, we would have one thirteenth less access to the internet. It's just one of those things you never think about them doing. Is it That's the cat amazing. picture part? Um, yeah, cool? yeah, exactly. Yeah, if, if, if it's not for them, then the cat pictures just don't roll. All right, uh, let's shift over to the gallery view. There's all of us. So, uh, and now I'm back at work. So thanks. I just want to give a big thank you, of course, to uh, to the whole team that kept the lights on while Paul and I were uh, enjoying the Costa Rican rainforests. Uh, you guys did a did a great job. Thank you so much for keeping the, the lights on, and I uh, couldn't do this without you. So uh, thanks everybody watching. Thanks to the moderators moderating. Uh, don't forget to join the weekly space hangout crew. Wshcrew.space. Uh, and I'm sure we will see you all next week. Bye, everybody.